When Canadians talk about free trade, they're usually referring to the international context. Maybe that's because it's easier to figure out than the Gordian knot of domestic trade barriers that have gone up over the decades. Lawyer Ryan Minucha makes a heroic effort to untangle it all. In his new book, it's called Booze, Cigarettes and Constitutional Dust-Ups, Canada's Quest for Interprovincial Free Trade. That book won this year's Donner Prize for the best public policy thinking, writing and research by a Canadian. And Ryan Minucha joins us now here in the studio. Great to meet you. And congratulations. Thank you, Steve. That's a nice thing to win the Donner Prize, eh? It was a thrill, absolute thrill, and I was honored to be amongst many qualified candidates. Oh, that's a very diplomatic, nice Canadian thing to say, but good for you, you won. I want to start by talking about, I mean, the, 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 the best story I think I've ever read is right at the beginning of your book, which perfectly explains the stupidity of how we don't have free trade within Canada. And that's about this poor guy from New Brunswick named Gerard Como, who simply wants to go buy some beer. Tell his story. What happened? Absolutely. So it was a, the fall of 2012 when Gerard Como goes from his uh, small town in New Brunswick over the border into Quebec. And he's doing it. He does this three or four times a year to pick up uh, beer because it's cheaper. And who wouldn't want to do what was cheaper and in their best economic interests? Um, and it was, so it was a lovely fall afternoon in October. And he comes back across with his haul in his trunk. And you say a haul, meaning how much did he have? He had, a, he had a good amount. He probably had over 300 bottles of beer. Okay. So it was, you know, it was not your, you know, your everyday shop, mm -hmm. but it was to get him through because it was cheaper. That that's just what he was, uh, was customer and for him. And uh, on this fall, fateful fall afternoon, though, he'd been doing it for a while. He gets apprehended by the RCMP. He gets pulled over and he gets fined. And this is what sets off for the next several years a large conversation in Canada about whether or not a Canadian from one province can go and do their shopping in another and come back with their wares uh, and do so protected under the Constitution. Um, it really put into the focus this really obscure constitutional clause. We'll get to that in a second. Okay. But let's just understand this. He was a New Brunswicker who went to Quebec mm -hmm. to buy beer and he came back with a few hundred dollars worth of beer mm -hmm. and that's yes. illegal. Yeah, under, under the New Brunswick laws at that point, yes. He had come back across in excess of the legal limit. And so he was fined, his beer was confiscated, and um, that was it, that was the story. And it's something that you might find customary going across an international border, but to Canadians, going into Quebec, that's totally different. Do you think Canadians have any understanding of the fact that <laughs> while you might be able to go to the States, and make some purchases down there, and as long as you've stayed or X number of days, you're allowed to. But apparently, you can't do it in Canada. Absolutely, and what does it mean to be Canadian? You know, we wear the same uniforms in time of war. We march behind the same flag during the Olympics. And there's got that, that conception of citizenship, that nationality. What does it amount to anything if I can't go and do my shopping on the other side of the border? And, um, you know, that's something that we think of as what defines us from another, another nation where we have tariffs and customs duties mm. preventing that kind of activity. And let's just understand, New Brunswick has this law in place, or this policy in place, because it's trying really hard to make sure that if you want to buy beer and you live in New Brunswick, you don't go anywhere else. you got to do it in New Brunswick. At That's the, the plan. At the time, exactly. They said, you know what, if you're going to purchase it, it they had uh, in the legal case, there were a few arguments about you know, public safety, but it really came down to uh, protection of revenue. Okay, this is, oh, are we gonna get into the weeds here? We are getting into major nerd dumb weeds here. Because this all relates to a section of our Constitution, mm -hmm. the BNA Act, the Canada Constitution Act of 1867. Here's section 121 of the Constitution, which says all articles of the growth, produce, or manufacture of any one of the provinces shall, from and after the Union, right, the Union, Confederation, 1867, be admitted free into each of the other provinces, period. It sure, you're the lawyer, I'm mm -hmm. not, but it sure sounds to me like that's a clause in our constitution that guarantees free trade among the provinces, does it not? That it does, it sounds exactly like a free trade clause. And that's what our friend, uh, Mr. Cuomo was taking before eventually the Supreme Court saying, what I did is protected because of this section 121 and then spirals into the story about what is Canada, you know? We can get into that about um, 
why did this clause exist? You know, in 1867, uh, we, there were, you know, customs uh, duties and, and tariffs in between the provinces. There were different currencies. There were different uh, postal systems, you know. And how did we synchronize? It was sort of an edict like that where it said, no, 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 we're one confederation. We're going to bring harmony. And um, part of it was the idea of free trade. Um, also look at the time in 1867, what had just happened. U.S. had just ab abrogated the U.S.-Canada Reciprocity Treaty, which was essentially a free trade agreement between Canada and the U.S. And post-Civil War, U.S. abrogates, number of reasons why. Um, but the point being, Canada was reacting to this. And it was saying, okay, well, we have to sort of, how can we guarantee conditions of economic growth for ourselves if we have fickle foreign trading partners who might suddenly pull the rug underneath us with a free trade agreement. But as far as Sir Johnny Macdonald was concerned, our first prime minister, who was there mm -hmm. on day one when this clause went in, this mm -hmm. meant free trade within Canada. That is, that is one interpretation. But then one must ask, what was free trade in 1867, and can that be allowed to progress over the span of time? But okay. So our friend, <laughs> Mr. Como, goes yeah. before, this is the New Brunswick guy who wanted to buy some beer, he yeah. goes before the Supreme Court of Canada, okay. and he not only loses, Ryan, he loses eight nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a shutout. He got nobody else to see his his mm -hmm. his way of thinking on this. Mm -hmm. What did the Supreme Court see that clearly he did not? Oh, the Supreme Court, you know, it is it was in a bit of a bind. You know, asking to accept uh, Kumo's sort of interpretation of the free trade clause was going to, one could argue, really unravel the fabric of Canada, which is this idea where we have 13 subnational jurisdictions. We have Quebec, Ontario, New Brunswick, and we're going to say, you're allowed to create your own laws. You have constitutional authority to do so. And with by interpreting it as a complete and unfettered free trade access, which is, you know, perhaps one angle of what one could go down, it really was going to limit the ability of provinces to regulate in their own backyard. But that sounds like more of a political concern as opposed to a legal concern. Do you think the Supreme Court made a mistake? The Supreme Court, it, it, it was a couple answers, a couple ways to think. One is, this was what, how the Supreme Court had sort of been answering this question for the past hundred years. Since the first Section 121 case back in 1921, this is kind of how they were answering it. So it wasn't, it, for them, it was going to be taking a step forward that was probably unsanctioned for them to really interpret this clause any differently than within the ballpark of what it had. To accept Kumo's interpretation was really pushing the envelope. And the Supreme Court was saying, no, legislature, this is for you guys to do, to deal with. Don't punt this issue to us and force us to upend an understanding of the Constitution. So just so I'm clear, Section 121, apparently laying out conditions for free trade within the country, it's still part of our Constitution. It is. It's still there. And yet the words don't seem to, over time, mean what they clearly seem to mean in black and white as you look at them. It was a lot of word wrangling in the Supreme Court decision to mm -hmm. allow themselves to back into an interpretation of that clause that isn't consistent with how it's written literally. Hmm. Okay, let's go back. I want to circle back to something that you were saying a while ago because you said we had this reciprocity treaty with the United States which governed trade and then we had, I guess, other issues that dealt with how we traded province to province mm -hmm. and so on. So take us back to 1867. What's the state of trade within Canada and without Canada mm -hmm. as well? Yeah, I mean, we can go back even before 1867, actually. It's this era called the, the, the era of the Corn Laws, where Canada had imperial preferences sending goods like fur and wood over to the UK because we were an imperial colony. Those were wrenched from us. And then following that, 20, about 20 years later, the US abrogates from reciprocity treaty. So twice inside the lifetime of these drafters of the Confederation, they had seen these foreign trading partners suddenly upend the, the trading order that they'd fact, grown accustomed to. Sorry to jump in, but I think I learned from your book that, that there were people, there were politicians in Canada around the time of Confederation who were so upset at the United Kingdom for repealing these corn laws that some people wanted to join the United States at the time. Yeah, it was a, it was a massive, especially the, the English in, in, in Quebec felt a little stranded and felt a little betrayed by this decision of the, of the, uh, of the UK Parliament. But, um, but at that time, think about it, it the, most, the simplest way to collect government revenue was on importation of goods into a country. And that is where the chief uh, the source of government revenue was for Canada. And um, 
as over time, you know, we look at 2023, there are so many sophisticated, way to, sophisticated ways in which government collects its revenue, its taxes, and um, we're no longer wholly reliant on customs duties, mm. um, which means that over time, how have governments really turn to protecting their economies, they use this thing called like a non-tariff barrier. They'll, they'll create these technical regulations and rules that effectively throw up walls to trade, but they don't seem as obvious as like a, a customs duty or a tariff. I want to know if we're any different from anybody else, because obviously the Americans have 50 states and they mm -hmm. presumably have laws governing what you can do state to state. Australia has states, Germany has states. How does it work elsewhere? Canada, so Canada is supremely unique in that we have gone a step farther than almost every other country in the world. We've, we've created an internal trade ecosystem where we have internal trade agreements between provinces, amongst provinces. This is wholly unique and it's essentially internalizing the concept of the World Trade Organization. And other, no other country has really taken it to, to this level where you have a constitution that is supposed to govern the relationship amongst Ontario and Quebec and New Brunswick, but then provincial governments and federal government have come in and said, you know what, to liberalize further, we're not going to tinker with the constitution, we're going to create this political agreement that goes a little further, like what we might see between Canada and the US with NAFTA. You correct me if I'm wrong here. I think there has been some progress made if you believe in free trade within a country. In as much as I think I remember maybe 30 years ago covering a story which said, if you want to sell beer in, in a province, you got to make that beer in that province. And it took a long time, but eventually you're allowed to sell beer in a province even if you don't make beer in that province. Is that the way it is now? Yeah, so on the alcohol issue, um, it's increasingly liberalizing. So after the Kumo decision and where the Supreme Court said, no, 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 you, you can't do this, sir. You can't go in, into Quebec and buy more than the legal limit, which I think was 12 beers. Provincial governments got to the table and they said, we're gonna lift the cap. You know, let's, let's come to a political resolution of this issue. Mm -hmm. And so over time, legislation has changed. Um, but I think one of the biggest things to think about is um, you know, there is no silver bullet. Like there, this, the continuum of liberali liberalized trade is one of those never ending constitutional projects. Hmm. And some people may want it farther than it is or you're not quite as far as it is. And you have to balance the interests of, of so many people, so many stakeholders. When you agree to, you know, lift the, um, the minimum build size with timber in a province, you're pitting forestry against cement and steel. Sure. It's, you know, these trade offs. Uh, but let me, let me make sure I understand where it is right now. Mm -hmm. Let's say Mr. Como mm -hmm. wanted to drive from New Brunswick, let's say to Prince Edward County here mm -hmm. in the province of Ontario. He's got some vacation time and he just wants to check out. He's heard they've got some nice wineries in Prince Edward County. Can he go to a winery in Prince Edward County and buy a dozen boxes of his favorite wine and bring it back to New Brunswick without breaking any laws? I definitely know it's more than two bottles. I actually don't know the answer as to how many he can bring in to New Brunswick. Um, but I, I would, based on the reforms, I think he would probably be safe. But again, don't hold me to that. <laughs> Here's a much more colloquial way of putting it. Yeah. Do you think this is nuts that we have all these trade barriers within our country? Yeah. It, it's one of those questions where, you know, you, you're, is it, are we, are we, is Canada all about maximizing growth? Are we all about what's the farthest we can push our GDP and trade amongst each other and unlock um, potential? Coupled against the other side of that equation, which is to what extent do we want to respect provincial differences? To what extent do we want to have New Brunswick come out and say, this is nice, we have this, this, this concept that is Canada, but we believe that we can protect against you know, uh, adolescent alcohol consumption best if we can retain control over the sale of alcohol. We want people to come to our government liquor stores because we can best ensure that people aren't over consuming. We're best trained to do that. So you believe there is a legitimate argument for allowing smaller provinces to have these laws on the books which are essentially protectionist and anti-trade. They are protect, and you know, it's it, there, there, there. There's, uh, you know, it could be like two uh, two sides of the same coin. Protectionist also equals respect for differences, and and it comes to to what extent is this argument protectionist, or is it a legitimate 
uh, legitimate policy? Are you really trying to protect your people? Like, is that re is your policy truly preventing the sale of alcohol to minors, or is Quebec doing just as good a job of it? And therefore, your argument is, uh, you know, it's got flaws. And well, it's, okay, it's, Look, I don't know, but it sure sounds to me like somebody's trying to protect their domestic yeah. brewery industry as opposed to mm -hmm. terror that mm -hmm. somehow the kids of New Brunswick are, mm -hmm. are are going to be left to their own devices if they have to go to Quebec and get a beer. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not yeah. disagreeing with me. That that is that is protectionist. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you believe in free trade within Canada, do you believe we're at least going in the right direction here? Are we in increasingly liberalizing trade within the country? Uh, it, I would argue yes. It's you know not going at the pace that most that many who are proponents of liberalization would like it to be going in. But from 1867 to now, we've seen a rapid increase in the amount of cross-border trade. In the past 25 years, we've created this new concept to resolve our trade differences, which is the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. This is this venue for political leaders to come together and hammer out differences. Because in the 70s, we had the chicken and egg wars, where you know eggs and chickens were laying rotten, eggs in particular, laying rotten in fields, because provinces were literally refusing access to those products in, in one another's jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, in 2018, we did have some disputes over you know Alberta blocking the importation of BC wine. Um, so it does flare up. and. Economic war, war, warfare is is perhaps a fact of hu uh, human nature and human existence, mm -hmm. um, but at least we now have a, a, a venue where we can resolve our differences and try to push and ensure that everyone understands where we're heading, which is Canadian growth and creating opportunities for Canada and becoming more competitive. Okay, let me ask you another example because uh, I don't think I saw this one in the book, but uh, again, going back over 30 years, I've covered stories whereby, and this is particularly the case in eastern Ontario, where let's say they're doing a big project, mm -hmm. some big infrastructure project in eastern Ontario. If it was an Ontario company that was seeking the contract, workers from Quebec could bid on those contracts and could be employed mm -hmm. to do those construction projects. Let's say they're building a highway in eastern Ontario. The converse was not the case. Mm -hmm. Ontario workers did not have access to Quebec-led projects mm -hmm. inside the province of Quebec. Mm -hmm. And Ontario obviously been fighting for a long time to try to get equal treatment for both sides' workers. Is that still out there as an irritant? Yes, absolutely. You do have sort of one-way situations where the policies for one province are more lenient than the other. The, um, you know, the, the, the Western provinces, they, so we have the Canadian Free Trade Agreement, and they decided, uh, and it's within their purview, that they would like to push liberalization even further. And so they've created a preferential scheme where you know, procurement contracts and, and you know, you know, maybe it's rebuilding a part of the highway um, have to get tendered out to other provinces at lower thresholds. Um, this is sufficient to say that yes, there is this. Dis but then Ontario, in your in your hypothetical, maybe Ontario benefits and becomes more competitive, unilaterally opening up the competition process. So sure. yeah, okay. But yes, uh, I'm gonna. We got two minutes left, and I want to ask you about you. Yeah. Where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from Toronto. Uh, and where'd you go to law school? I went to law school at Harvard. You went to Harvard? Yes. How come? U of T not good enough for you or <laughs> Osgoode Hall or what? No, they're all fantastic <laughs> institutions. I was just really excited because uh, Harvard had a fantastic program. Uh, Professor uh, Professor Wu was sort of definitely a leading uh, a luminary in uh, international trade law, international trade policy. Well, that gets to my next question. How does a 29-year-old kid, well, you're 29 now, but you weren't when you went to law school, I guess. Yeah. How do you get interested in a subject as arcane as this? Oh, it, it was so fat. Like the, yes, the, the the entrance definitely came from international trade law and policy. Um, but then I was realized I came to understand and appreciate Canada has its own sophisticated and complicated domestic ecosystem, and I wanted to be part of that conversation. Yeah, why? Because <laughs> I just I, I I find it fascinating. I find there's that citizenship linkage and feeling of of wanting to help the nation, the, the country, sort of wrestle with this challenge we've had since the Confederation, and and um, you know how how can I on the margin contribute to uh, the discussion, and which I was more passionate about. Do you think we'll ever have genuine free trade within Canada in your lifetime? No, we will not have unfettered free trade in my lifetime. Because there's just too and many there's too just, many interests in it otherwise. The, too many interests, and I don't think that's who Canada is. I think Canada is a country that has to bring together the second largest man, land mass in the world under one roof. And how do we do that? We have to respect differences. So you're okay with that, that we don't have free trade within Canada? The, yeah, we don't have absolute unfettered free trade. Mm -hmm. I do think that we can become more liberalized. It's not binary in my mind. Gotcha. Yes. Okay, and with a really cool title and... Uh, <laughs> 
and a very funny bottle opener on the, uh, <laughs> on the cover of the book, which sure looks a lot like uh, the country you're writing about. <laughs> Uh, booze, cigarettes, and constitutional dust-ups, Canada's quest for interprovincial trade. It is a nerdy subject, but it's actually a really readable book. Ryan Minucha, thanks for coming into TVO. Thank you so much. It was an honor. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.